nope, that's South Park. That's not it. <laughs> Well, hello there. I'm Nusha, also known as Ferocious and Pretty Pens, and welcome to another video. You may be wondering, what am I going to talk about now? Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the Mont Blanc Rouge Noir Baby in Ivory. I'm a little baby. <laughs> in Ivory. <laughs> when I purchased my pen, I bought it from a European retailer because I don't believe it's available in the US. I'll double check and depending on what I find, I'll put it here. Tell us, Editing Nusha, is it available in the US? The second part of this video is going to be uh, still about Mont Blanc, but it's going to answer a couple of your questions about my 149 acquisition and how I knew what to buy, what I was looking for, etc. So um, as always, feel free to skip around depending on what you're interested in. But I want to preface everything I say in this video with the fact that I am not a Mont Blanc expert. I'm not an expert in vintage Mont Blanc. I'm not an expert in modern Mont Blanc. I just like pens and uh, that's what my channel is about. So I'll do my best to impart information I have and resources that are out there and available to you. So if you're interested in this pen or if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the 149, then keep watching. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button and the bell and all of the youtube -y things that people are supposed to do. I don't know. Now, why did I buy this? What, you know, was I thinking? In my last video, if you watched it, I know I said I thought that this pen would be bigger and it's not. Would I have bought it if I had known that it was going to be this size? Quite frankly, yes. And this is why I say this. The nib is still good. It still feels pretty good and weighty in the hand. And it's a Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc, in, in my world at least, has a very recognizable brand. Everyone, you know, who sees this emblem, you know, there we go, get it to focus. Everyone who sees this emblem knows exactly what it means. They know that it's a luxury writing instrument and I wanted to buy something that was brand new. All of the Mont Blancs that I owned up until this one were previously loved and I think that that's totally okay, but I wanted, you know, something new, something that looked cool and Quite frankly, because I'm a cheap bastard, there you found out my secret. <laughs> I was looking at the price too, and I saw that it was the same price as a 146. It's not limited because it's not numbered. It was a special edition, etc. But um, I just, uh, you know, I wanted something brand new for once, and so I just I went for it without really reading the details or knowing exactly how big it was. What I thought it had a piston filler. It does not. Uh, it's a cartridge converter, etc, etc. So let's get into the details of this pen and what I think it's important for you to know. This pen has a lacquer finish over it, over metal. So it's a metal body with a lacquer finish and it's glossy. It's very beautiful as you can see. The thing I worry about with this is that, you know, will it chip over time? Will it scratch? Who knows, we'll see. I'll be very careful with it and uh, make sure that it's always in a pen case. But it gets a little bit awkward because none of my pen cases are this small, so maybe I need to get a single pen case specifically for this pen. It has rose gold accents. It has the Rouge et Noir logo on the top of the pen. And on the back end, you see that there are threads. And these threads are very specifically so that you can post it without scratching the body of the pen. Something that I constantly forget with this pen, I've had it for a couple of weeks now, is that it is not a screw cap. It is a slip cap. So it's a little uncomfortable to me to, you know, have an, a pen that's in this price range and have it be a slip cap like this. I don't know why that is. I think it's because I'm afraid that as I uncap it and recap it, if I get it in the wrong angle, which I don't even think you can really do, but in case you can, I'll be the one to do it, that I'm going to somehow catch 
some of the you know threads that are on the inside of the pen and scratch up the, the nib and the, the grip section. And then the other thing too is that this is not a piston filler, which is interesting. It is a the standard International Mini, the same one that goes in Caveco Sports, but not the ones with the plungers because it won't fit in here. So you're basically beholden to um, using a syringe to fill up uh, one of these smaller cartridges for the lifetime of this pen since there's no other real way to drop ink. Or you can buy one of these uh, Caveco squeezy cartridges, but I hate those. The other thing is that it has like this spring mechanism on the inside to, I don't know, <laughs> to do what? Just be aware of that. And then down here you have this interesting white band that makes it I think so that you are less likely to actually chip the finished edge of the lacquer. And then the grip section has brushed metal and it has this slight flare at the end and the nib is the standard nib that is in some of the other Mont Blanc models such as the full size Rouge et Noir Heritage as well as the Mont Blanc 1912 Heritage with the retractable nib. Now, for sizing. Here's two comparisons that I think are easy to make. To me, this is, as I said before, a pocket pen, but it's a luxe pocket pen. And when I think of other pocket pens in my collection that are metal bodied, I think of the Caveco Lilliput in copper that I have. I bought it because I'm interested in seeing how it patinas over time. It's something I'm not worried about getting scratched, etc. As it gets older, it gets better, just like me. <laughs> just kidding, but I'm not, I'm serious. I'm like a wine. So when you look at these two, what's interesting is that the Lilliput with its full copper body capped is about the same size as the Mont Blanc. With that said, what is even more interesting is that when you post both of these, the Lilliput length of it is a little bit longer. So if you have bigger hands, the Lilliput might be better for you in the sense that it might fit into the groove of your hand a little bit better, but the Mont Blanc has a little bit more girth to it. <laughs> girth, I said the word girth, and I'm gonna keep it in the video. <laughs> so all in all, it just depends on what your preferences are for this to be in your hand. The baby, the Mont Blanc baby, is a little bit heavier than the Copper Lilliput. When I say a little bit heavier, two to four grams. It's not a huge difference, but it's something that when I hold the two, I'm able to tell. It was before I even looked at the numbers, which is, I think, pretty cool. What, am I psychic? No, but I guess I'm... I'm a little bit more sensitive to weight. Another pen that this is very comparable to that maybe I should have started talking about this first is the Mont Blanc Heritage Rouge et Noir with the serpent around the cap. I figured I would go with Caveco first because if you don't have any Mont Blancs and this is something you're interested in, this might be more of a useful reference for you. So I figured I'd start with the Caveco and now we'll go to the thing that it's really super comparable to. So I have the Rouge et Noir in Coral that they released. The Rouge et Noir Heritage is still available in black. So if you're interested in this overall look feel but want a bigger pen, the black one is still out there and available. And pricing wise, it's a similar price point. Let me just show you really quickly the two of them next to each other. The grip section is pretty much the same except for the original, uh, not original because this pen goes back to the early 1900s, the Rouge et Noir line. So this one has threads on the grip section. They're not sharp by any means. It's still comfortable instead of this flare on the baby. Now with all of that said, is this pen worth it? I can't tell you how to spend your money. What I can tell you is that this is an elegant pen. I like the finish of it. I like the way that it looks. 
I like the ivory and how it contrasts with the Rouge et Noir logo on the top of the pen, on the cap. What do I not like about it? Well, it, the fact that it's not a piston filler, the fact that you're paying the same price for the most part as the other Rouge et Noir pen, Heritage pen, the full size, and that one has a piston filler, this one has a slip cap, That's that throws me off constantly. So it's up to you to decide whether or not this is worth it, but this is what I think of it. And really quickly, here is a writing sample. All right, so this is my handy dandy Nebula Note by Colorverse with 52 GSM tomato river paper. And the ink that's in here, if you are interested in knowing before I write it out, is Pilot Urzuku Fuyusayogan. I probably mispronounced that, so if I did, just pretend I didn't. It's totally fine. As you can see, the pen, as I go and I'm kind of coloring this in, is able to keep up. It's a fairly wet ink to begin with, but it's putting down a good amount of ink on the paper, which is always good. I'm going to speed you guys through this because uh, it might be a little bit boring just watching me color. <laughs> hand letter I have zero spatial awareness so you don't really get to see that on my Instagram posts but it's true I never know how big to make things to make them look okay I never know how much to expand or contract my letters for consistency when I am trying to fill up a specific area with text Oh, and in case I didn't mention it earlier in this video, this pen also comes in black. Ooh, that R got weird. Now that I've mentioned the spatial unawareness, you're not going to be able to, to not see it now. <laughs> Now for line variation. One of you uh, called me out recently <laughs> for being heavy handed and I know. I don't want to push this nib too far. It's a little bit of line variation, but not very much at all. Yeah, there you have it. There's the writing sample. Overall, really good writing experience. Feels good in the hand. Overall to me, the weight is perfect fits very nicely into the groove of my hand, and uh, I could see doing long writing sessions with this. It's not overly heavy, it's not too light, it's just right. Oh yeah! This out of the way. <laughs> I just tried to, to screw the cap back on. I still haven't figured it out. At some point I'll get used to it, but just not yet. Okay, so now let's talk about vintage Mont Blancs. Now, a lot of you asked in the comments of my comeback video, how do you know what to look for when you're buying a vintage Mont Blanc? How did you come across the 149? How did you know that it was gonna be a good pen? Blah, 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 blah. Well, let me give you a little bit of background. I own other Mont Blanc vintage pens. They are pens that I'm not gonna go into any depth of detail because there's a lot of information about Mont Blanc pens that's out there. You just have to know where to look and I will put some of those resources in the description below. So feel free to check those out. There are a ton of people out there that have massive you know, memory banks of information that they have made available on personal websites, etc., on Fountain Pen Network that know a lot more about this than I do. But I've dabbled in Mont Blanc before. I have some older Mont Blanc pens that have interesting nib varieties, etc. But what I will tell you is that you can have the same exact pen that looks pretty much identical and have both of them with medium nibs. Both of them have nibs that are 
the the tri-color toned whatever you want to call it single tone and they look very similar but one of them might be super flexible in a wet noodle and the other one might be hard as nails and they're the same exact model made in the same year etc you really don't know with Mont Blanc because my guess and this is just an assumption I'm starting rumors but my guess is that maybe Mont Blanc, because they were available in so many different countries, maybe they produced nibs that were slightly different based off of what they believed those specific markets were looking for. I think that that's a possibility. Some of the older Mont Blancs don't have serial numbers, so there's really no way to know where it originated and you know who, who bought it where, when, etc. So keep that in mind. There's a fountain pen network post by somebody that is also on Instagram that I'll link below that basically breaks down what to look for in those nibs, uh, for the 149s at least. The 149 and the 146 are the classics. They go pretty far back in history. The 149 goes back to, I believe, the... 19 late 1950s early 1960s the 149 is one of the most recognizable through history one of the longest lasting models in Mont Blanc history so it, you know it, it's uh, an important one and I wanted something that was a great everyday writer that, you know, I didn't need flash. I just wanted something that was plain simple. I could put any ink color I want in it. It has an ink window. It feels good in the hand. It's, again, an iconic pen. JFK is photographed uh, using it. And this pen really took off in the 60s and 70s. And today you can buy the Mont Blanc 149 for close to $1,000. I did not pay a thousand dollars for this 149 and the thing is because it's been around for so long and the 146 too there's plenty of them out there there's really no reason to pay today prices for a brand new one when there's great ones that are in great condition that are out there it just depends on what you're looking for if you're someone that's looking for something that has a flexible nib and that's your requirement you're gonna pay a little bit more for it um, I'm not going to tell you what I paid for my 149 because it was a steal. <laughs> um, and I don't want anyone to come for me. And I have no idea the gentleman's name that I bought it from at the DC Pen Show. But he was a vast encyclopedia of Mont Blanc knowledge. He restored the piston. It's very smooth. The nib is perfect. The feet is perfect. It was perfectly clean when I got it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. The key thing with these is that you either have to get it from a reputable dealer that understands what something that is flexible really is versus something that is semi-flexible versus something that is springy because there is a vast difference. If you get something that is springy, my 149 is springy. It's not flexible. It's not semi-flexible. It's springy. It has a little bit of bounce to it and provides a little bit of variation when I write with it. Here's a a quick sample of this. With that said, you need to, to have a relationship with a retailer that has the chops for vintage that can actually tell you if what they are selling you is what you're looking for so you don't have buyer's remorse at the end. And I've been very lucky. The 149 is not the only Mont Blanc that I have. I also have a Mont Blanc Monte Rosa which is a, um, I believe, 1950s entry-level pen that has a semi-flex nib. I have a Mont Blanc 342 that has a really, um, again, springy, bouncy, semi-flexy nib. I also have a Mont Blanc 252. These models are probably models you've never heard of before, but they're more than 50 years old these pens and they're still in perfect writing condition the pistons work really well and the nibs are, are amazing so find a reputable dealer or a, a storefront that sells in used Mont Blancs for example 
uh, not sponsored, but Peyton Street Pens has a massive section of pre-owned vintage pens that have flex. Look there. And Peyton Street Pens has very good idea of what flex is and what it's not. And they rate all of their nibs. So that's another place to look. But again, it just depends on what you're comfortable with spending. The only way that you're gonna know is if you try the pen. And if you can't try the pen, ask for a writing sample, ask for photographs of different aspects, do your research. Don't just buy something because nine times out of 10, if it's too good to be true, it usually is, unless it's one of these lesser known models of Mont Blancs. And that's a wrap. I hope this video has been helpful. If the Rouge et Noir was something that you were looking at, the baby size fountain pen, I hope that you have some better idea of what to expect. And if you were looking for guidance on vintage Mont Blancs, I hope I've given you a couple of pointers and places that you can use to look up some information so that you know what to look for. And yeah, it, tell me in the comments, you know, do you own any vintage Mont Blancs? What has your experience been? Is, you know, my experience in no two nibs are really exactly the same between Mont Blancs a reality? Or is that just something that I made up in my head? And if it is, it's totally okay. We're friends here. You can tell me. I'm not going to get offended. But yeah, leave it in the comments. Let me know. Uh, and if you're not subscribed, you should think about subscribing because there's cool stuff coming for the next videos. By popular request, the next video on this channel will be a brand review of Dominant Industry Inks. I have like 10 bottles. Okay, maybe not 10 bottles. It, it might be 10 bottles. It might be 12 bottles. I don't know. Apparently, I don't know how to count. Stop judging me. You're not my real dad. It's awkward. But anyway, we're going to do a brand review of Dominant Industry Ink. And I have some of their shimmer inks. Some that are light, some that are dark. I have some of their standard inks too, and we'll go through those. And I also will leave one of the inks so that I can show you the Kakamori nib, and we can swatch it together and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Uh, we'll see you on the next video. Pew, pew, pew. I don't know. Don't forget, keep writing. <laughs>